Um, okay, it is time to start the meeting. I don't have a dinger. I used to have a bell, but uh, I don't know where it went. But anyway, welcome to the meeting tonight. I'm Catherine Luckner. For any of you that are new and I haven't met personally, um, I know that I probably have seen you. I've lived here since the mid late 80s and I've probably seen you somewhere. So welcome tonight. And I hope that you all take water. There's lots of it. Whatever you see, there's more. And um, I always bring little treats because some of you get here and have to stay past six o'clock and, and I get accused of taking your dinner hour. So I'm, I'm not going to do that to you. So tonight we have um, what I consider to be a pretty wonderful opportunity. And we you see that on our agenda, we don't have our sheriff tonight. He's on vacation and our uh, code enforcement officer uh, also... Here. He is here? Where? Oh my gosh, you're here. I'm so glad you came. That's wonderful. Because I think a lot of people were taking vacation. And, I, and look at you. I love it. You want to come up and give us some news? Because I didn't put you on the agenda, but I would love to have you come up. That'd be wonderful. This is Bern Pisatora. You may have met him the last time if you were here. Oh, I'm so glad to see you. <laughs> Hello, folks. Um, well, with the uh, season winding down, we're kind of catching up on everything that we've uh, been investigating. In the month of May, um, we had uh, four reports of overgrowth, yards, weeds, grass, and stuff like that. We were able to uh, work with the uh, property owners to bring everything in compliance. Um, we had a couple of reports of um, uh, short-term rentals that we were able to um, bring into compliance. One was uh, the advertisement not being properly uh, displayed on the websites, brought that property into compliance. One other property, we filed a um, court order for a recurrence of violations of uh, short-term rentals. So that's that's in the works. Um, we also had an issue last month that we were able to resolve with a uh, street vendor in the village selling you know jewelry and hair products uh, on the sidewalk. <clears throat> <clears throat> the county only allows for um, flower and food vendors to set up on the right of way. Um, the street vendor could not, so I, she had to file for a um, temporary use permit, and that would only allow her to sell on a business owner's property. Um, so she was asked not to come back, and she has it set up on the uh, on the sidewalk. Uh, also, we had. Um, been conducting uh, weekend sound level noise uh, readings for Gilligan's and uh, the Daiquiri Deck. I think one of them was Blazik uh, Cafe. Uh, so far, all of the readings have been in compliance. Uh, they know we're out there taking the readings every weekend. So, you know, that's where we're at. Now, any questions? <laughs> And that's it for me. Thanks a lot. Oh, that's really wonderful. What a nice surprise. Thank you for being here. It was a great wrap up of things that we had uh, asked about just that last month. Okay, so our sheriff is on vacation and he will see us again in August because if you notice on the bottom of the agenda, we don't meet in July. That's because we're all, we'll be doing it up at 4th of July, right? And it's always the same week as our meeting. So what, we're not going to fight it, right? <laughs> so just go and have a great time. Um, so tonight we have a guest speaker that uh, we're very honored to have. I'm, I'm proud to say, I don't know how, what his focus is when he first got his um, professional degree, but chemical engineers are a very special uh, type of degree. Not easy at all. And I know what it takes. I I'm married to one, so I have a great respect for the fact that he has that kind of background and training. So I'd like for you to have a big welcome for David Tomasco, Dr. David Tomasco. Just, I hate to say this, I'm not a chemical engineer. 
Well, I but know. there's another David Tomasco oh, who is one, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Most of my family are like coal miners and steel workers, but there's a chemical engineer out there and a marine biologist, which is kind of strange. There's a lot of marine biologists in Western PEA. That's still chemical. <laughs> so we do the, uh, we do the uh, display screen. If I do that, I will see if I'll get the control. Oh, yeah, okay. No worries. You guys can see this, all right? right? Not really. Not really? Oh. Okay. <laughs> well, we're stuck between a uh, rock and a hard place. Okay, so I don't know how to do controls. I guess I can do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey, can I give okay. it a shot for a sec? Sure. And this may or may not work. Yeah, you got it. What year is it? <laughs> oh, there. All right, there we go. And then I think you can just uh, yeah, does that work all right? It works for me. I don't know if there's any better. Because oh, yeah, oh, okay. yeah, it's huge. Yeah. Much that's better. great. Now, it's like oh, that's it's wonderful. So, no, see, that's one for Zoom. Okay, yeah, that's but it's working for them. That's fine. Cool. All right, so the yeah. first thing that they talked about was um, all right, so uh, I'm going to talk about uh. Yeah. Talk about midnight pass and then talk about little Sarasota Bay. Well, we're not going to just talk about that because there's more to the health of the bay than just that. So, next, please. Yeah, I'm going to mute everybody. Everybody on Zoom, please go on mute. So, when we talk about the bay, the first thing we, we don't talk about chemistry right away. We don't talk about like, uh, we talk about the quality of life. So this is what uh, your neighbors uh, do. This is what I do. Uh, the number one goal for the Sarasota Bay Estuary Program is to improve water clarity as good as it should be for that particular location. Because people go out throughout their anchor and they stand around in waist deep water and they want to be able to look down and see their feet. And they don't want to have rafts of macroalgae wrapped around themselves, their family, and that sort of thing. So quality of life is a big part of it. Next, please. So important for our economy. There's 20,000 jobs that are associated with bay related activities. The commercial fishing village of Cortez, there's not a lot of commercial fishing villages left in Florida. We have one right up there on the north part of the bay. Recreational fishing guide and the waiters and waitresses and bartenders and restaurant owners for uh, waterfront properties and also the people who rent your jet skis. And there's also a property value uplift associated with proximity to the bay that's probably about $4 billion. So your ability to pay for schools and police and fire is a function of people wanting to live next to the water. But think about what it was like in 2018. And you know how much did you want to be on the water in 2018? And um, also, we know that during a red tide from a really neat work of a project that was done by the University of Rhode Island researcher, property values are depressed 20 to 30% up to mile inland uh, and coastal properties experiencing a red tide. So red tides depress property values. People pay more to live on clean water than they do on dirty water. Next, please. And there's a lot of habitats that depend upon good water quality. So for example, we want to make sure everyone understands the things that we talk about, because not everyone's from Florida, and not everyone who's from Florida spends a lot of time underwater, like I do. So this is an underwater photo that shows seagrass meadows and mangroves. And hopefully you can see the school of fish there. So about 70% of the shellfish and, and fin fish that we like to eat or like to catch depend upon things like seagrass meadows. And so this plant right here is needing water to be clear because it needs sunlight to penetrate through it. So the water clarity is really important. Next, please. And so I show this slide because it's the cutest picture in the world, right? It, these are people bottle feeding baby manatees. But the reason why they're bottle feeding baby manatees is because their moms uh, starved to death, drowned because there wasn't enough food, because the Indian River Lagoon is in a state of near total collapse. Water quality is bad, the water clarity is reduced, the seagrass biomass in the Indian River Lagoon has dropped 99 to 5%, and we have lost statewide 20% of our manatee population. Over on the East Coast in the last two and a half years, on the East Coast, it might be 30, 40%. We don't want that to happen in Sarasota Bay. So for it not to happen, we have to do the following. So managing Sarasota Bay means managing nitrogen. If you want your lawn to look nice and green, add nitrogen. If you want your bay to look green, add nitrogen. If you want your tree to grow fast, add nitrogen. If you want algae in the water to grow fast, add nitrogen. But you don't want that. So it's really about managing nitrogen. It's not adding it, it's like controlling it, which means find out 
where it's coming from and how much you have to reduce it. Uh, click on it again, please. So yeah, so the red represents the only thing you have to measure. So state of Florida gives a report card about how healthy systems are, Biscayne Bay, Apalachicola Bay, et cetera. And it's based only on going out and dipping your uh, hand into the water and taking a water sample. But there's a lot more to the health of the bay than that. And so we actually, and our partners, measure the water quality every month. Sarasota County, Manatee County pay for that. The seagrass maps are mapped every two years by the water management district. The fish populations are, man, are monitored. They've been monitored for well, about a decade, I think more than a decade, at 200 spots throughout Sarasota Bay. And so all these things, and we actually use volunteers. If you want to volunteer with us, we train volunteers to go out there, snorkel on the grass, and, and quantify how much algae is in there, the big tumbleweed type of algae. So all of this stuff is out there, and all of it is important. Next, please. So with that, we come up with a report card. The report card has four elements. Two things are in the water, nitrogen concentration in the water, uh, chlorophyll A, which is a measure of how green the water is, which is a measure of how much algae is in the water, and then the amount of seagrass meadows, and then the amount of big clumps of macroalgae that doesn't fit in a water bottle, but is easily blown up against the shoreline. So all four of those things are in there. And we take our results and we color code them. Because what matters is not the number, what matters is the pattern the spatial pattern and the pattern over time. Because my audience is not, you know, given a presentation like this, my audience is not to like, you know, PhD marine scientists. That's like preaching to the choir. We want to expand the congregation. We want more people. That was a great place to use that term. <laughs> so we want to get more people to understand what it is that we're talking about and why we need to do some really expensive things. So next please. So we have a report card that includes four metrics. It's based on reference period. And that reference period is 2006 to 2012. We don't know what Sarasota Bay was like 100 years ago. We don't know what it was like 50 years ago. We have water quality data that goes back 30 years, but we don't have like the algae, which is really important as well. But we know that 2006 to 2012, we had lower nitrogen, we had less algae in the water, we had less macroalgae, and we had a 28% increase in seagrass. That is good, and that is an attainable goal. So our report card is, how are you compared to that time when this bay was healthier? So next one. This is our report card. Remember, blues and greens represent good. Blue is like offshore, Gulf of Mexico, good conditions. Yellow is caution, like something's going wrong. Take care of, you know, watch what you're doing. And red means stop. Something is, you need to fix this or else it's going to become, you know, bad. And what you can see is 2006, 2012, it was blues and greens across the bay because this was a healthier bay across the bay. 10, 15 years ago. It wasn't that long ago when this was a healthy bay. Palmasola Bay, which is up in that north corner, you know, around like a, a between Bradenton and Anamaria Island, that still is a healthy system. And um, so there's lessons we can learn about how did Palmasola Bay stay healthy. The upper part of the bay was doing pretty good until 2018 when it shifts into yellow. That was the red tide. That was the strongest red tide we've had here in probably about 20 years. And red tide... If it's more than 100,000 cells per liter, it's strong enough to start killing fish. This is 14 million. So it's 140 times stronger. So it killed a lot of fish, made its own fertilizer, it lasted a long time. We lost 20% of bay seagrass in one summer because it was so very dark. Um, so the lower bay shifts to yellow back in 2013. It rained a lot in 2013, but what really happened is that was the beginning of a five-year period where we had more than 750 million gallons of wastewater overflows from Sarasota County's Bee Ridge Wastewater Treatment Plant. 750 million gallons. That is more than three times as big as what came in the Piney Point. And so that set us back for years, if not decades. That got rid of about 20 years of successful you know, improvements in water quality. That's not happening anymore. Sarasota County is in the middle of extending uh, more than $200 million to upgrade that wastewater treatment plant, and it'll be state-of-the-art, as good as the city of Sarasota, which is probably one of the best ones in the state of Florida. And so that's not going to happen. So you can see that we start to get better in around 2021, but then 2022, we have Hurricane Ian came through. And Ian was more powerful impact in the lower part of the bay than the upper part of the bay. So Palm Sol Bay doesn't have a problem with the lower part of the bay which was blues and greens, 2021, we were like bragging about how great it was. Look at this recovery. Look how the water quality has gotten better. 
and then 2022 came about. But you're always going to have hurricanes, and hurricanes will set you back whether people live in the watershed or not. So next, please. So the big difference between that healthier time period and the latter time period is the nitrogen load. And the nitrogen load is about 20% higher. Why? Because more people moved here, more impervious area, more grass clippings, more dog poop, more stormwater runoff, more wastewater, more overflows of wastewater treatment plants. And so if we want to get back to that healthier condition, we have a goal of a 20% load reduction. Or another way to look at it is 12 tons. 12 tons of dissolved inorganic nitrogen. That's not going to be easy, but it's not going to be impossible. So next one, please. Can we get 12 tons? And the answer is yes, we can get 12 tons because there's more than 12 tons of what we call controllable nutrient loads. Reclaimed water. Do you guys have reclaimed water in Siesta Canes? No. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah. Because reclaimed water from the Siesta Key, uh, excuse me, from Sarasota County's wastewater treatment plant is way too high of nitrogen and it will just cause Excuse me, more nitrogen to come through than the grass needs, and it will create a plume of nitrogen that moves out laterally into the water bodies. If you do have a lawn, please fertilize carefully, and you do not need to fertilize your lawn in the wet season. You get enough nitrogen from rainfall. Rainfall's got more nitrogen than tap water. Uh, but reclaimed water can be a great way to like irrigate, but reclaimed water from a treatment plant like the city of Sarasota is about two milligrams per liter, Reclaimed water from the biggest wastewater treatment plant in Sarasota County, Bee Ridge, was 18. It was nine times higher. So that's a big difference there. But those overflows, six tons per year, those aren't really happening anymore. And we know they're not happening because we get money every time they have an overflow. And we don't want that money. <laughs> we put it away in a bank account for restoration. We don't use it for our program or anything like that. We've set it aside for restoration and we're not getting checks anymore. And I don't want those, I don't want that money. I'd rather not have that money. Uh, so there's more than enough to do what we need to do. Next one. Yes. Oh, that's probably me having that. Uh, so once we get that, we, we don't want to like spend all this money, get our water quality back, and then let it deteriorate again. Because what the story of Sarasota Bay is this is really the re-restoration. Sarasota Bay Estuary Program is one of 28 estuary programs in the United States, patterned after the Chesapeake Bay Program, but the oldest one because in the 70s and 80s, Sarasota Bay was in such bad shape that locals around here asked for an EPA program to tell them what needed to be done. And we got better. This bay was healthier, then we kind of let it slip away from us. So we want to spend that money, get that system back healthy, and then we don't want to let it slip away because we have more people. But there's other things happening, which is we're going to be faced with challenges over the next 30 years that we didn't have over the last 30 years, which is the climate is changing and you can debate it, you can believe it or not, it doesn't matter. It is changing and we're gonna show you some of the data. We don't rely upon reports, we rely upon data. We got lots of data. This is a shot of Lombo Key Village and this is what's called blue sky flooding. Blue sky flooding because there's no rain clouds. And also you can see it's not a stormy day. It wasn't like you had a storm that like blew water over the top of the seawall. The water in that road is from uh, Sarasota Bay coming up into the streets through the storm drain on a high tide with a full moon or a new moon, what we call a spring tide. Spring tides aren't seasonal. Spring tide means a tide that springs forward, you know, when you have a full moon or a new moon. So this is the kind of thing that we're seeing. Next, please. We've got a lot of data on, on, on water levels and water level of course i've lived and worked on boats for 40 years water level changes over the course of the day it changes of course the week month and all that these dots represent the average monthly sea level um and over the last 20 years and if we look at the total period of record that we have there's a lot of variability but there's no trend if we look at the last 20 years there's a lot of variability but an underlying trend that red line goes through that cloud of data and it shows sea level has come up six inches in the last 20 years. We expect it to come up another eight to nine inches over the next 30 years. Mm -hmm. so it's not scary, it's not terrifying, but it's not zero. And what it means is that there are things that are gonna happen, they're gonna get worse. And I think what we're gonna see more than anything else is we're gonna see it's gonna be harder for streets to drain uh, run runoff when it rains on the high tide. And that's what we're seeing in more and more places around the Bay. Next picture, please. This is, uh, if you want to see uh, blue sky flooding, 
go out on a, we're going to have, I think, a, uh, we're going to have a spring tide in about three days. So go there, look at your tide tables and go up to Bradenton, Riverview Boulevard at 22nd Street. It's the best example. Picture on the bottom, that's not a canal, that's a road. And that's happening right now. Blue sky, there's no rain. And that's not a rough day. You could paddleboard on that water right there. But that water has come up into the street. If you go there on a high tide, and this is not a king tide. King tides are, are a different type of tide. It's called a perigonal spring tide. This is something that happens twice a month for two to three days. And you can actually see fish in the streets. They're not big fish, it's not a snook, you know, unfortunately, but they're small little fish and they are in the streets on a high tide. And that's just what happens. So that's the best example we see. And if you can see the picture on the right, see where that orange cone is? See the concentric ring around that? That is the water from uh, the Manti River being pulsed as it comes into the street. So imagine trying to sell that house, you know, uh, during that, or worse, imagine buying that house on a low tide and you come back in the springtime. You're like, this is salt water. This is not rainwater. This is salt water. Next, please. This is a really neat data set. This is uh, more than 100 years of temperature data. If you have an airport, you have a great air, uh, you have a great air temperature data set. And so, what this is, is each one of those little squares represents comparing the month of that year, January through February, all the way from 1900, to what was the average temperature for that month for the 20th century. So 1900 to the year 2000. So the average January, the average March, the average September. And if you were exactly the average, then you're a clear box. If you're cooler than average, you were kind of light blues, and then if you're really cooler, then you the, the darker blues. If you're warm, your yellow's looking to brown. So if you look at the first 100 years, it's kind of a mixture of yellows and blues. Look at the last 20 years, and what you see is it's hardly any blue. We are consistently warmer than we were the last century. We used to average two to three freezing temperatures per year in Sarasota. If you've lived here long enough, do you remember how you would have your sheets that you would put out on top of your vegetation? To guard it against a, a freeze. How often have you done it in the last decade? I do the last few years. Yeah. It snowed. I remember when it snowed. Yeah. <laughs> we used to start off August days in the 60s. Not every day, but and, and certainly not noon, but you would start off in the morning in the 60s. We haven't had a single hour of any of the days in August of the last 20 years where it's been cooler than 70 degrees. It just doesn't get, this is what greenhouses do. Greenhouses aren't meant to make it warmer. It's meant to keep it from being as cool. And that's what's happening. Our water temperature, it appears, it used to be about nine months a year where it was above 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Now it's 10 months. So the concern is what if it never goes below 68 degrees? The water temperature in Gulf Mexico is 90 degrees right now. And we're in June 1st. And it's 90, it's not 80, it's 90 degrees. So it is getting warmer. And that means a couple of things. One of the things it means is, next please, sorry. You do a great on that. <laughs> uh, we've got a database for uh, tropical storms and hurricanes that goes back to before the uh, Civil War. And each of those dots represents either the number of tropical storms and hurricanes on the left-hand side, or on the right-hand side, category three and higher. And the red line is the five-point moving average. So Rather than complicated stats, you can just see the overall trend is increasing tropical storms the last couple of decades. But look at the graphic on the right, which shows category three and higher. The first half of that data set, there's an awful lot of zeros. We've always had hurricanes. We've always had strong hurricanes. But we had a lot of years in the first part of this data set where we didn't have a, a major hurricane. We had a hurricane, but not a category uh, three or higher. And the last part is very rare where we don't have a category three or higher. Mm -hmm. We've had Irma, we've had Michael, we've had Ian. You know, Ian was a category five, not when it hit, made landfall, but Ian was a category five out of the Gulf of Mexico. So it was Michael who made landfall. So there's some powerful hurricanes because hurricanes are heat engines and they're taking warm and moist air and warm water and they turn it into mechanical energy. And the mechanical energy is winds and waves. So we're making more powerful hurricanes by giving them more energy for them to feed off of, basically. And one of the reasons why that's important is, other than the impact that it has on us and our neighbors, it is the impact it has on water quality. Next, please. So this uh, is drone photo that we took of Blackburn Bay in August of 2022 on the top, and then October of 2022 on the bottom. So the August is in the wet season. 
and beautiful. And this is what we were talking about, how beautiful the bay was looking. And then look at the bottom picture. And it looked like root beer. And it didn't smell like root beer. It smelled like a compost heap. Um, but we had problems with uh, that we're going to talk about that are related to uh, hurricanes, but also related to the susceptibility of Little Sarasota Bay due to the closure of Midnight Pass. So we had a problem with water quality when Ian came through. Next, please. So we sampled water quality three locations in each of the three bay segments, the lower part of the bay, three times. One week after Ian, two weeks after Ian, four weeks after Ian. We were out there uh, like four days after landfall sampling water quality. And the graphic on the left is the amount of bacteria. The red line means the never to exceed value, which means this is out in the intercoastal waterway. This is uh, bacteria level so high that it's unsafe for it coming into contact, like you dip in your hand in the water, that sort of thing. And it stayed that high for two weeks. Um, the graphic on the right is the amount of algae in the water. And you can see that red line is our target and it stayed elevated for two weeks in all parts of the bay. And Little Sarasota Bay was the highest amount of algae two weeks afterwards. So that is really probably a function of the long residence time of that system. Next one, please. So it did get better, but how did it get better? Because it moved all that stuff out to the Gulf of Mexico. So all the porta potties, all the overflowing wastewater treatment plants. We had, we don't even know how much wastewater overflows we had because so many of the reports were over 2,000 gallons. So that's like the minimum reporting in it. So over, no, over a thousand gallons, excuse me. So it could be 10 million gallons. It could be 1 million gallons. It could be 1,100 gallons. We don't know. All we knew is it was over a thousand gallons all over the place. Where I live in Palmetto, we had uh, wastewater overflows that were never reported at all. And yet I've got video of them. Uh, so we don't know, but there's an awful lot of wastewater, an awful lot of stormwater runoff, a lot of dog poop, a lot of grass clippings, a lot of fertilizer runoff came into the bay. And then it washed out into the Gulf of Mexico. And what we had is uh, we triggered a red tide. And so this imagery right here is from the European space satellite called Copernicus. The warmer colors represent more phytoplankton. And in this case, it's red tide, Karenia brevis. So we see one week after that, we see a red tide that is probably several hundred square miles in size. Uh, Tampa Bay is about 350 square miles. The area that's yellow to orange is more than that. So I don't know, 200 to 500 square mile size red tide. And that red tide hung around our coast and moved up to the north. And two months later, we had that red tide that was so strong uh, this last winter, if you remember that. Next, please. So on to the topic that we also want to talk about down here, which is Midnight Pass, Little Sarasota Bay. So the picture on the left is taken sometime in the 70s. It's basically, you know, hovering over Casey Key, looking to the north. And you can see uh, Casey Key to the bottom, Siesta Key to the north. And you can see the pass between the two, which connects Gulf of Mexico to the left and Little Sarasota Bay to the right. And that island mass in there is now the Jim Neville Marine Preserve. The picture on the right was taken by a drone pilot uh, in August of 2022. There's no pass there. Um, but what it shows as a marine biologist who actually put myself to grad school as being a commercial fisherman, it has an awful lot of fisheries habitat there. And that type of fisheries habitat that you can see is important consideration. So what you see is the mangroves and you see seagrass spinners. You can see to the bottom of that bay. Little Sarasota Bay is definitely different. It's definitely got problems that need to be addressed, but it is not dead. Don't use that language. It doesn't help you make the case if you want to reestablish that tidal connection. So seagrass meadows, mangroves, those are things you have to take into account if you want to reestablish that tidal connection. Next, please. So the effect of closing that pass was studied very intensely 30 years ago. It needs to be studied again because the bay is different. It's warmer, it's deeper now than it used to be. But nonetheless, this was the most detailed study because it was a calibrated model. People actually set instrument towers up there to measure how the water moved. And then they played around with the uh, model with different scenarios, but there was a calibrated model. And so if you wanna know what did Midnight Pass its closure due to circulation in Little Sarasota Bay, you can answer that by next one, please. Click on the uh, red boxes and you see the numbers 27 and 74. That's the amount of water exchange over 10 days. It used to have 74% water exchange after 10 days, where the pass closes is 27. So it's a two thirds reduction in circulation with the closure of that pass. Next, please. As Little Sarasota Bay becomes 
poor, poorly flushed, Roberts Bay becomes better flushed because the water still gets into Little Sarasota Bay on an incoming tide, but it comes in not just from the west, the north, and the south, but from the north and the south, predominantly from the north. The other thing that's done is, what that means is when Filthy Creek is discharging, it now gets transported into Little Sarasota Bay. So Filthy Creek affects more than Roberts Bay. Filthy Creek now comes into Little Sarasota Bay. That's probably why you had the problems for that five-year period, because you're now susceptible to a pollutant load that you probably weren't susceptible to in the past. That's an important consideration. Uh, next, please. Uh, so one of the other important questions is, what did the intercoastal waterway do to uh, the past? And uh, this is a complicated uh, topic, and this is a 30-year-old model. But this model, basically, uh, you can answer that by looking at those two numbers. So when you look at the green circles, 70 and 83, that suggests that constructing the intercoastal waterway increased the flushing in Blackburn Bay because Blackburn Bay is right next to Venice Inlet. And think about Venice Inlet and the ICW going through there. Venice Inlet has existed you know, for a long time. It used to be called Casey's Pass, but it has been really ex excessively modified. And the ICW you know, definitely affected uh, Blackburn Bay. But next please, Little Sarasota Bay, maybe not as much. And that's actually an important consideration because uh, the construction of the Intercoastal Waterway has been suggested by some as doing that pass to failure. Intercoastal Waterway was basically finished in 1964. This pass stayed open for 20 years mm -hmm. after the ICW was completed. So it certainly might have had an effect, but did it doom it? If it did, it took 20 years. And that actually is important because that means what kind of a project do I need to reestablish tidal connection? Do I have to go all the way to the ICW to get water to move enough to be stable or not? And that's an important consideration to, to <clears throat> consider. Next, please. Water quality. So if you want to reestablish a tidal connection, don't call Little Sarasota Bay dead. Don't call it a toilet that needs to be flushed. That doesn't help you. It's not accurate. It doesn't help you. Because if you're an outsider and you hear that, it sounds like you can't take care of your wastewater. You can't take care of your stormwater. So you just want to flush the toilet in the Gulf of Mexico and make the next red tide worse. That's not, you're not going to get a lot of friends that way. <laughs> Don't say that, it's not true. What is true is you have a water quality problem that exists, but you also are acting upon the water quality problems that uh, you can act upon. So these dots represent the average nitrogen concentration on the left and chlorophyll concentration, how much algae is in the water on the right. And the red line here is the two point moving average. And what you can see is the highest nitrogen was a couple of years ago, about 2016, 2017 time period. And it was going down until Ian came through, but you were spending a lot of money on wastewater and it is driving your nitrogen concentration lower. 20% reduction in nitrogen gave you a 50% reduction in the amount of algae. Be proud of that, use that, because if you wanna reestablish the tidal connection, you don't wanna give the impression that you have a toilet that you wanna flush into the Gulf of Mexico. You wanna say, I dealt with my water quality issues as much as I can, now I gotta act on the other thing that is affecting it. Next please. also fish you're gonna to have to take into account the fish habitat that's out there. There's 600 acres of seagrass in Little Sarasota Bay, and most of it is clustered right around Midnight Pass and Jim Neville Marine Preserve. And because you have that much fish, excuse me, that much seagrass, you have a lot of fish. Uh, FWC samples 200 spots throughout Sarasota Bay. They've been doing it for over a decade. They sampled 30 different locations in Little Sarasota Bay. And if you take the number of fish divided by the sampling effort, it's called catch per unit effort. It's number two only in Palm Solo Bay this year. The next year after this report, it was number one. There are a lot of fish in Little Sarasota Bay, but they're small because we've known for 30 years, Little Sarasota Bay is a nursery habitat. And maybe that doesn't matter to you, but it does matter to the people who have to sign up on your permit. And if you only like big fish, you have to worry about where they were when they were little because you don't have big fish if you get rid of the little fish habitat. So it's important consideration to think through as you decide how are you going to describe what you wanna to do to a regulated community that's gonna be skeptical about this kind of thing. Next please. However, I've spent half my career in the private sector and I've worked on three tidal restoration projects. All three of them got their permits, two of them are already constructed. And the one that's most similar to this that I've worked on is a project in Puerto Rico I worked on. And so, this is a picture of uh, the San Juan Bay area. If you've ever flown into San Juan, you fly in uh, to the airport in an area called Carolina. 
and you fly over this area. It looks like a Brazilian favela. That's to the right. That is the Martin Pena Canal, Pena Martin Pena. That canal used to connect San Jose Lagoon in the middle to San Juan Bay proper to the west. And that canal has filled up with garbage. And so my project was to determine the ecological benefits, water quality and habitat of reestablishing that tidal connection. And if you look at San Jose Lagoon in the middle there, it's kind of similar to Little Sarasota Bay in the sense that it's not connected to the Atlantic Ocean. It's connected to two water bodies that are themselves connected to the Atlantic Ocean. So what we found in this system was that there was a problem and all we had to do to get our permits, and we had Puerto Rico Department of Environmental Quality, EPA, Army Corps, National Marine Fisheries Service looking over our shoulder, we got the permits. All we had to do was show that we had this thing called salinity stratification and bottom water hypoxia. That's it. So what happens is in the rest of the normal parts of San Jose Lagoon, the salinity is kind of equal top to bottom, but in San Jose Lagoon, uh, when it rains, there's not enough water movement. And so the water tends to be fresher on the top and it traps the water below it. And there's no oxygen because it's not getting oxygen from the atmosphere and it's kind of dark. So it's not getting any oxygen from photosynthesis. And that causes a DO crash that causes very low levels of biological productivity. That's what happened in San Jose Lagoon. That's all we needed to show to get the permits for reestablishing that tidal connection. So does that happen in Little Sarasota Bay? And the answer is, next please, it does. So this is after the storm, one, two weeks after the storm, the salinity stratification, the bigger the number, the more the, the layering, if you would, of fresh water on top of the salt water, and the highest numbers in Little Sarasota Bay. And the oxygen levels are lowest in Little Sarasota Bay. The same problem that we had in San Jose Lagoon is what you have in Little Sarasota Bay. That, in fact, that the algae levels were very high two weeks afterwards you've got a problem and you can't fix that with wastewater and stormwater. You got a problem that needs a tidal restoration project. Thanks, please. So the, the issue is the estuary program is not against reestablishing tidal connection. The estuary program is not gonna tell people what to do, but we're just trying to point out 15 years ago, this community spent $800,000 and didn't get close to getting a permit. You just didn't. I mean, you were basically told, uh, withdraw it before we deny it because if we deny it you might not get another swing on it so if you want to go through that again go through with the exact same design as you had 15 years ago but if you want to be successful maybe try a different approach so what we're suggesting is try a different approach and one of them is uh, you have to have a do nothing scenario which is it's going to be required army corps national Marine fishery service the ep you're going to have to sign up on your permit one of the things you're going to look at is like do nothing which means don't do nothing, but it means what are you doing right now to improve water quality if we don't have this tidal restoration? So you highlight your stormwater, you highlight your wastewater investments, and you make yourself look good. You're not trying to flush filthy water out of the Gulf of Mexico. You're trying to address the issue that's still there. Next one, you could just basically reestablish a wild pass. And that was the plan basically 15 years ago. But are you familiar with Heron Lagoon? Heron Lagoon is the old pathway for what was um, blind path. So look, you've had a pass that connects the Little Sarasota Bay and the Gulf of Mexico, but it has moved miles up the coast. But now you got houses on the Barrier Island. Mm -hmm. Heron Lagoon used to be the connection between Little Sarasota Bay and the Gulf of Mexico back in the 1920s until the 1921 hurricane came through. Passes moved. Uh, look at the history of clam pass in Collier County. Collier County maintains clam pass between outer clam bay and the Gulf of Mexico. They've had to dredge it multiple times. They've had to dredge it twice in a year. So passes will move and passes will close in this area. Next one. What's gotten a lot of attention is let's just put in a hardened structure with a jetty. Let's do that, right? Venison, that kind of thing. But look at that right there. That is from the southwest looking to the northeast. That boat is coming in from the Gulf of Mexico. And what you see is look at the beach on the north side and look at the absence of the beach on the south side. You put in something like this, and if you live on Casey Key, you might not be too happy <laughs> because the reality is sand moves north to south as a function of the sea breeze and the Coriolis effect. And so not only are people living south of a hardened jetty not going to be happy, but you're not going to have an easy time getting a permit for things that need a beach like sea turtles. This is a very difficult thing to do. So we're suggesting maybe look at a fourth scenario as well, which is a culvert, and I don't mean culvert like a pipe. I don't mean something with uh, a pump and electricity and something romantic and stuck in. 
I mean, the big kind of things. A culvert is just basically a description of a structure. It could be concrete, could be uh, sand with concrete on part of it that allows water to move past uh, a barrier or a barrier island. It's only 200 feet from the Gulf of Mexico to the Little Sarasota Bay. It's not that hard. I've actually got a project in the Old Tampa Bay I worked on that was 200 feet, uh, but allows water to move and would still need to be maintained, but wouldn't have as many regulatory issues as some of the other things you might want to do. It's a commonly used technique in Rhode Island, in Massachusetts, Connecticut, and there's one right here in Tampa Bay and in Fort DeSoto, you can see it. It won an award in 2015. So just a consideration. Look at four different things, not just one. How big is this culvert? Depends how big it needs to be to allow the water to move through with it being uh, stable. Whatever you do, you have to maintain it. You, there's nothing you can do that you can just put in and walk away. You're going to have to maintain anything you do. Now we're talking about a closed pipe or we're talking about an open... Could be, could have a top on it. I don't mean a pipe. If you look at the, the best probably example of it would be uh, the one that I worked on. The last one I worked on was in Old Tampa Bay on the east side of Courtney Campbell Causeway. That was a $20 million, um, basically a bridge, which is a culvert with a road on top of it. Cost $20 million, which is, you know, not cheap, but it's not that expensive compared to like some of the other costmen out there. And that has a four lane highway on top of it. <laughs> so you can establish tidal connection. It's a common thing that's done in lots of locations. It's just how you do it. But yeah, nothing that a man would get caught in. Something, if you make it too broad, then the velocity might go down a little bit and it could fill up. If you make it too narrow, then you might shoot out too much sand in too many locations. So it's really a matter of the engineering. Next, please. But first thing, please, whatever you do, meet with the regulators up front. Don't spend hundreds of thousands of dollars and then find out that we can't permit this. Meet with them up front, find out what are the constraints on what they can permit, what they can't permit, and come up with something. This really, you're one of the few places that has been unsuccessful for 40 years. And I saw Jim Herbert earlier, and I really apologize that it's been this way, but don't keep doing the same thing. Try a different approach and you'll probably be successful, I think. And next one, please. So uh, cleaner bay is more resilient bay. Keep this in mind, the bay is changing. The water's getting higher. It's not scary, it's not six feet, but this bay will be different over the next couple of decades. It's getting warmer. We're gonna be more likely to be hit by uh, more powerful storms over the next 30 years than the last 30 years. And whatever you do, this bay being cleaner is gonna be a more resilient bay for you. And last one, if you, no, that's perfect. Uh, if you want to uh, learn more about our program, go to sarasotabay.org or point your phone camera at that QR code and that'll take you to what's called our ArcGIS uh, version of our uh, comprehensive management plan. And uh, you can download the PDF and you can actually have it read to you in the accent of your choice. Thanks, we'll put it on our website too. Yeah, sounds good. Perfect. And uh, uh, that's it. That's all I have. Questions for, from everybody about the, some of the ideas and the things he was sharing. One over there. I read about uh, the, when the closure originally happened back in the 80s, that there was uh, a requirement to be uh, the homeowners relocate or attempt to relocate back. And that had failed. Uh, why has why that failed in the past? And what uh, can be done going forward to ensure that it doesn't fail again? I, I don't know why it passed, but that's a really, really important point because they never had a permit to close the pass. They had a permit to move the pass. And uh, honestly, a lot of people think they shouldn't have gotten a permit to do anything. They should have just like moved the house. <laughs> um, but that's not what happened. And, um, but that is really important because the permit obligation was not to close it. The permit obligation was to keep it open. They tried, I think once or twice, Jim would know better than I did, but I think they tried it once or twice, didn't stay open. And then uh, they got let off. And I, I don't, people like to, you know, demonize the folks who did that. They thought they were going to do something that was going to be a, a fix that would work. I'm not the coastal engineer, but that's definitely, that's where the, that's where the engineering expertise has to come in. How can we do something that actually is not going to close up again? And that's why the idea of a culvert might make some sense. Something that actually is a physical structure that would be difficult to, uh, you know, close up. Another question here? Oh, Jim. In 1983, they had a problem with renting their homes. So they went to get a phone permit. They got an authorization to do what they did. And single one without any studies, nothing at all, they started to dig and hired Bergsteiner to do it. 
And after the first dig, after the second dig, they tried five times. Right. After the second dig, we were down, one of our people was down there, and they talked to, they was, he was one of the, he went up to the Solomon house and asked to talk to him about it. He said, this is never going to work. And the answer was, shut up and keep, right, keep, keep doing your job. Mm -hmm. And after the fifth time, they gave up and said, the heck with it. The county sued them. They settled for 15,000 apiece. <laughs> Solomon paid it. And Carter negotiated it down to 5,000. They closed it for 20 grand. Yeah. That, that's you know that's really important. The history is really important. Is maybe this was going to close by a hurricane, but it didn't. It was closed with danger. Yes, I think, ma'am. Um, I'm curious. Um, in one of the slides, it showed uh, that Palm Sol 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 Bay, Sol Bay yeah. was the healthiest. Yeah. Okay. I've heard people say that. Um, the horse with, with all of the horseback riding that yeah. you do in there, that that it was it was making it worse. And when I look at that, I'm like, well, maybe we should bring the horses here. <laughs> I, I've given a lot of presentations in Bradenton that always gets brought up as the horses. Mm -hmm. The horses are having an impact without a doubt. Uh, they're trampling, but like it's uh, it's not really in the sense of the bay as a whole. It's just not noticeable. Uh, horses do poop, and uh, it appears from some people that they're trying to get the horses to poop in the water because that way they don't have to clean up after them. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's I've actually, not <laughs> I've seen some people who basically said that they are, they, they, they want the horses to poop in the water because that way they don't have to clean up after them because they do have to clean up if they poop, poop on the beach. You can't make a horse poop truck. I, I don't know, man. <laughs> I can't make my dog. <laughs> but I do know that like, um, uh, regardless of those issues, we just I just looked at bacteria day to day. A pump cell lake continues to be a pretty healthy system. And despite the fact it's got a causeway, despite the fact it's got horses, and that probably has to do with the way it developed. So if you go drive around Palmasola Bay's watershed, um, it's kind of a more of a blue collar neighborhood. There's not an awful lot of hard stormwater infrastructure. So you don't have curbs and gutters and stormwater pipes that take all the lawn clippings from Came on and blow it out into the bay. It's not like that. No one has lawn service. I live in Palmetto. No one's got lawn service in Palmetto. And so we don't over fertilize our lawns and we don't have those storm drain overflows. And it's almost like LID by accident. By being cheap, by not wanting to pay for sidewalks and curbs and gutters, they actually, when it rains, it soaks into the ground. And that's probably a good way to like mimic how to develop. Yes, sir. Hi, um, I live on uh, just just south of Blackburn Point Road on the water. And I saw on your chart comparing the years and different locations we've been most close to a bay, that Blackburn uh, Bay, you have it as a uh, good control, 2022. 2022 is a terrible year. Yeah. On the water. yeah. How, how does that, how do you, how do you, Rationalize it to be on your scorecard to be green. Yeah. When we couldn't even go outside for about four months to enjoy our outside, and we had a massive fish kill. Yeah. Um, it wasn't bad enough long enough during the calendar year. So, for example, you know, the red tide bloom this week. Yeah. The, the presentation you give, though, says clean. It's good. Yeah. Not great, but it's good. It's well, not. But if you go back, it, it actually used to be blue, so it did degrade, but that hurricane impact was in the last three months of the year, not earlier. So the three months, and you know, we did show that it had, Blackburn Bay had the bacteria levels that were higher than, the only place that exceeded the bacteria levels was Blackburn Bay. It's true, but like the water quality for nine months of that year, because that photo that we showed you, that was also Blackburn Bay in August, in the wet season. In August, in 2022, Blackburn Bay was in really nice shape. In, in October, it was not. In 2022, but the issues that we have are going to be a map that has yeah. shoreline, is sit there and rot all summer, and uh, uh, the obvious red tide, the, the fish kill that we had. Yeah. Those were not following me, or at least not immediately following me. They were six months later, eight months later. So I, I just, I, I have a hard time 
seeing your scorecard, you're yeah. waving your green to, okay, it's okay, it's good, it's getting better. It's, but it's terrible. Well, it's related to what it was like 2006, 2012. So that wasn't pristine back then, but uh, yeah, we, I'm, I go diving on a regular basis. Two, two weeks ago, we were diving in Blackburn Bay and Little Sarasota Bay, and there is lingia out there. It's that gumbo, people call it snotgrass, mermaid's hair, something like that. There's a lot more of that in the upper part of the bay. That is not something that's unique to Blackburn Bay or Little Sarasota Bay. And actually, your numbers, we just crunched them um, like two days ago, your numbers of the amount of macroalgae in Blackburn Bay as of April were lower than any other part of the bay. So, I mean, I know that it differs spatially from one place to another, but you know, when we showed that picture, the area of photography in October, it did, it looked horrible. It smelled horrible. We had the very high levels of bacteria. In August, it was beautiful. And I think you had more pretty days, if you would, in the early part before the hurricane came through. But yeah, you were so close to the input from um, Don and Roberts Bay. And I think that was one of the biggest problems is we went out right after uh, Ian came through on an incoming tide, Donna Roberts Bay's flows get shoved up north into Blackburn Bay. And some of the worst water quality we had in Blackburn Bay was in the southern part, close to Venice, because you were also close to Shackett Creek and, and all that influence as well. So my concern yeah. is that you show a chart like that, and you're showing some improvement and you're showing it you know, four colors that you've got, yeah. blue being the best, green being next best, yellow then red. And when you're saying that that area is green, you're presenting to the whole community that it's good, but it isn't. I couldn't, I mean, I couldn't, I'm not making the numbers up. You're not living there. <laughs> but I'm pulling water samples there. And I'm I'm diving to the bottom of that bay. Your whole chart was about quality of life. Yeah. Not about your samples. It's about quality of life. You made a very big point of differentiating between them. They yeah. and quality of life. Well, the report card is nitrogen, chlorophyll, algae, and seagrass. And I can give you the numbers on all of them. Okay. I do think there are places get lost, and there are subtleties that get lost, but we do we do bring up the fact that like the, the only aerial photos I've showed you were Little Sarasota Bay and Blackburn Bay. And I also showed you that we did have very high levels of bacteria. So the score turned out to be green, but it used to be blue. So it did show degradation. Yes, sir. You mentioned the sea grass. I apologize. I didn't know how much time you had. You could go right okay. ahead. Yeah, sorry. You mentioned the sea grasses and the, and the loss of sea grasses was because of nitrogen. Yeah, it's mostly uh, the thing that mostly affects our water clarity is how green it is. Uh, Florida is pretty flat, so we don't have an awful lot of sediment that actually clouds the water like in like Mobile Bay or, or uh, Chesapeake Bay. We're flat. We don't erode our watershed so much. Uh, so what mostly affects us is how green the water is and how green the water is is a function of the nutrient load and also um, the residence time. So Little Sarasota Bay, two weeks after Ian came through, had 100 micrograms per liter chlorophyll. That was by far the highest we'd seen at any time. And that was because it was green. If that was sand, it would have settled out really quickly. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, the Grand Canal system is nine miles long, it's the highest in the Pretty green, but it's also filled with sediment. Is there any way you could geoengineer that system so we could grow sea grasses in the canal? One of the best things about that canal, and I've, I've been out through that thing, is like it's not excessively deep. So I think your depths in there, are, they're less than 10 feet, right? Aren't they? Four to six feet. Four to six feet. And that is good because honestly, that may be a hassle for your boat. That means it's not so deep that you can't get oxygen in the bottom. And that does mean you could get seagrass to grow there. Uh, there might be uh, one of the things that we've been working with uh, some of you guys with is to get more of those artificial reefs, or we prefer vertical oyster gardens because you know the state agencies don't like plastic, even though they're permitting plastic seawalls everywhere. Uh, but they don't like plastic artificial reefs, so whatever. So anyway, we're promoting oyster gardens. If you want to like, um, uh, we work with the oyster boys to actually, you know, we work with restaurants to collect their oyster shell and we have uh, volunteers who string them up and you hang them underneath your docks and allows oysters and more filter feeding. But definitely one of the big things is 
please don't make that canal that much deeper. Because if you want to see bad water quality, go to a 12 foot deep canal. And, and that's where you have a real problem. This the 1974 study by New College said that canal is eventually going to just fill up with all the sediment that the stormwater utility keeps sending in off of the roads. So it's not going to get deeper. I think people, I think there's less, there's less uh, stuff in, uh, and, well, you know, there is, the water's now, the sea level is now like six inches higher, but I think there's less sand and runoff than people think there is, you know, and yeah, they can be localized and everything like that, but if it's too deep, then you get an oxygen and then you get that muck buildup. If it's shallow, and I've been into, you know, mild in that canal and it's still a sandy bottom. That's really pretty cool. That's not one. There's one question back here. Oh, I'm sorry. What is there a way to geoengineer and take all that sediment out of the Grand Canal at one time and then it'll stay clear for a long time? So it's 100 years now, it's probably still sediment that was there for 100 years ago. You yeah. know, be careful what you ask for. If you took out too much sediment, you might make it too deep, you might have a worse problem. We have a question in the back. Yeah, the, the one thing I was going to ask, a little, little off topic, but I'm just saying is around. Uh, Big pass with the last storm. Yeah. A lot of the sand migrated in turbidity and was brought up in the South Lido with the great ball. Is, can we, is there a way to do a, a seagrass study that it compares to the last one that was done? I, I would really be lost with it. Yeah, seagrass is are mapped uh, every two years by the district. They do it uh, usually in the November to uh, February timeframe. Uh, so the last map was 2022, the next one will be 2024, which means this coming November to the February, a couple of months later, is going to be when they shoot aerial photography again. So it'll be followed up in just uh, uh, about six months. Jim? Yeah, you were talking to me more about the big habitat that's in the uh, little part of the day now. Um, it used to be little fish well, I'm a Yeah. I believe they, they had that before because up the creeks and the canals were very happy. A leading creek and other broke by you could be a host. Yeah. Wouldn't it make sense to try to reestablish? Those areas have have it after the juvenile. Uh, yeah, I think it does. I mean, the the greatest um, percentage of the shoreline in mangroves is in Little Sarasota Bay, and that surprises people unless you go there. And because if you go around Little Sarasota Bay, you see more mangroves than in Roberts Bay or in other areas. And so, yeah, I think I think you can take advantage of the fisheries habitat that's there, and and I think you can do more. And I think. You know, we're not against a tidal restoration, but I think it needs to be carefully thought out how you do it. But I think there's, I think there's a way for it. I don't know. Well, any other questions? Otherwise, we will go ahead. One more. If you, if you open up in advance, are you going to have a problem with red guys coming in? Little It'll be easier for red tide to get into the little Sarasota Bay. In 2018, where red tide was raging up around uh, Big Pass, New Pass, St. Armand Circle, if you remember how bad that was? Remember how there was no business and just flies everywhere feeding on the dead fish? The worst red tide levels were up around Lumbo Pass with 14 million cells. Little Sarasota Bay uh, had less for a couple of reasons. It's harder for red tide to get in. Right. And it's a lower salinity, and red tide does not do that well in low salinity. So, yeah, it would be, uh, you'd be more susceptible when you have red tide. And honestly, red tide is not going to go away. Humans make, we don't cause it, and we make it worse. And the biggest source of nutrient loads for making red tide worse is the Pusnasky River, and there's nothing on the horizon in the next couple of decades that's going to make a demonstrable dent in that. The biggest project out there is the C43 Reservoir. It's going to reduce nitrogen. Load. It's not built. It's not even close to being built. It's not even designed. Closest it's going to get is maybe a five, six percent reduction in nitrogen loads coming out of Clusa Hatchie. So the Clusa Hatchie is going to continue to fuel worse red tides over the next couple of decades. So it's just not going away. On that cheerful note. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you so much. Oh, great. That was wonderful. And I appreciate it. I can't wait to have another opportunity to have you here. Thank you. So that was really good. Okay. So one of the things that um, I wanted to give opportunity to, and I think there's a couple of folks here that have worked with the Midnight Pass Society have been involved in the the push towards, you know, finding a way to do additional research for the issues that are facing us. And I don't know if anyone here would like to make any comment about it at this point. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I think that that funding, is that still on the governor's table for signature? I thought so, that he has not approved that just yet, right? Okay, so we will uh, hear more about that another time because there's just so much to talk about that I think is worthy. And I sure think we've had a great opening tonight. So I really appreciate Dr. Tomasco being here. Um, so the biggest thing I think for us, and it's been a wonderful thing is, as you all know, and many of you probably participated in it, is what has been happening with the mini reef project uh, here on Swift the Key. And I think what I'd like to do now is to let Jean Cannon, who's really the master of all mini reefs over here, she has been the um, true superstar of getting all of these in here and has some reports to tell you where we stand with it. And she would like to inter introduce the rest of the folks that have been working with her on this um, for the last two and a half years. One of whom I know has been interested in this for probably the last 40. And that's Phil Chocho over here, who uh, came to a neighbor's house of mine about almost five years ago now. We were at a little garage sale on the Shell Road there and got to talking about this. And next thing I know, I'm reading all this data from long ago and far away, and I know he has it. So anyway, he's part of the team. And Gina, I'm going to let you go forward. you want to come up? Yes. Thanks. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much. I'm getting, getting forward, looking forward to this presentation. We're going to talk about what we've done in the last, I would say, 60 to 90 days. Uh, we started off with a wonderful opportunity, a $35,000 grant from an a, a anonymous donor who provided the grant to Ocean Habitat so we could purchase many reefs at a 50-50 discount. That was at least uh, 215. We actually sold more. Okay, so we're working on a deal to get the other couple um, held in there. So we just did, and believe it or not, we did it in less than 90 days. So we had our CSEQ residents step up and purchase these mini reefs at um, $165 or $169. And we're going to put in over 215 more mini, mini reefs in our canals. I'm grateful to this community for what they've done. Now, I would like, I'm going to have my team stand up for the first, for a minute, just for a minute. So, Becky, I'd like you to stand up if you wouldn't mind. Mary Lee, I'd like you to stand up if you wouldn't mind. Phil, Dave, and Kent. And I, I would include their wives as well. <laughs> and they're laughing, but they know I call them enough that they should include their wives. Please so, come up, because we're going to get a picture of this team while you're still walking. Yeah. Come on over here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're working with the I mean, you can bring something up. One thing I told you, we have to come from behind the computer. Wait a minute, I have to say stop. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you're getting a mini reef today. We are. We're super excited about it. Um, we're excited to see more life in the canals. And we're um, hopefully we see more dolphins and manatees. Um, yeah, we're just excited to see what it brings. 
All right, go Mini Reef. This house is getting six mini reefs. Six. So this is our installation of a mini reef. This is Dave, right? Yeah. Dave is in the canal, in the water, standing up. And he's going to strap these under this deck. They'll be out of sight, out of mind, and they won't interrupt any boat flow. And they will attract tons of new little fish and water cleaning friendly oysters and, and whatnot. And here they go into the water. And that's it. Out of the way. I'm not I'm not gonna interfere with anybody's lifestyle. Gene used the term citizen scientist, um, and we were serious about that. None of us are marine biologists or chemical engineers, as was mentioned before. Um, we are learning from others like Dave. We're learning from Moat, the Moat Lab. We're learning from other organizations and, and similar civic groups that are, are doing the same thing. Um, so I think that's one important point that I, that I would want to make. Um, it, the, the core group has been really on the science side, uh, citizen science side, has been Phil, uh, Kent, and myself. But uh, as, as Jean also mentioned, and on the slide, we've been really successful in getting great volunteers uh, to join our team. Becky's been great on the video monitoring. Susan, Catherine, we have others as well. Um, we have already started a monthly testing process in two of our four zones in the Grand Canal. Um, uh, we'll be doing that through the summer, um, and what we do is we have selected sites, and we do the water testing and video monitoring. Um, uh, our goal is in the fall that we will be expanding to the other two zones in the site and uh, really even adding more testing locations, but we're kind of starting working our way up with our volunteers and, and our training. What are you um, testing for? Yeah, I'm going to show you. That's the next slide. Um, I, I, um, there's a there's there's two two types of measurements. One is, and I'll show you the equipment in the next slide. Um, uh, a, a number of measures, really, particularly the third column here, lists the uh, the, the technical measures that are that are uh, coming off of the equipment: salinity, turbidity, pH levels, dissolved oxygen is a very important one. Um, there are two important ones that we are not currently measuring. Uh, Dave talked a lot about nitrogen and nitrates. Uh, we don't have the equipment uh, at this time that measures that or also same with chlorophyll. So we're hoping to uh, be able to eventually add those to our testing. But we're going to be getting a lot of good information uh, from these measure measures as well. Uh, maybe we'll go to the next one. On the left side, we're trying to give a little few pictures to give you a feel for the water testing. This is the equipment. There's uh, put right directly into the water when we make the measurements. Uh, there's actually two types of equipment. Um, and you get readings off of the equipment, which is fed into 
uh, a great uh, database that Ken uh, has developed and is ma maintaining that. Um, so over time, as we're collecting this information monthly, uh, uh, eventually quarterly, uh, we'd love to be able to get out, to out collecting data after major rain events uh, as well. So we will be assembling a really good time series of data uh, here's just one example of the types of graphs that can be produced, but that data will be able to show, uh, similar to what Dave, sh Dave showed, uh, the changes in the data in, in these measurements uh, over time, uh, and we can do that at selected docks, we can do that in the zones that we have created, we can do that for the entire canal system. So we're just really beginning, but we will, I think, have a wealth of information that we can add. And our goal is to have that information feed into the state of Florida uh, water atlas uh, as well. So, you know what, you don't mind going back real quick, and I know we, we have time. Mm -hmm. Just want to, do want to just point out the, the, the last slide, the third slide. Okay. Uh, the right hand side is on the video monitoring, because while the data is important, uh, really the the, the graphic ability to be able to see what is happening around the mini reefs is probably the most effective visual, uh, obviously. And you heard that they heard that noise. That was a total shock to me uh, uh, that, that 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 was even happening underneath my dock. Um, uh, uh, and again, we have great staff, and Becky and Phil has been leading the, the way on that. Uh, so at the same time, we're doing the water testing. We are taking these video monitoring under the docks on a monthly basis and again on as we as we move along we'll be able to track the volume of fish activity and other marine life activity uh, over again time series data uh, uh, as we as we continue to build up this database so that's the last thing I think I want to okay. point out that. I just want to point out that what you said was the fact that we not only are taking the testing and, and record, um, reporting, but we're also doing the video, video monitoring. So we're going to have with each of these monthly reviews, a small video that goes along with it. So we can in fact see over time how things are changing and we'll be able to report over time what we see and we'll be able to compare the different segments of the canal as well. That's really quite critical and using the digital tools allows it. Finally, I've got to make sure I say something about Phil. Phil is my partner. He is, without him, I couldn't get in, I can't get in the water. So whenever I have a problem with Phil, <laughs> so Bill comes over and gets in the water and takes care of something that's broken. He always is wonderful like that, but more importantly, he also gives me, he's been the lead in all of our, our video and setting it up. So I don't, I just, I just consider him to be my right hand. So I never say anything. Bill is wonderful. So thank you very much for your work. And then the last thing I want to do is make sure that I have any questions that might be offered up about the south end of Turtle Beach, because that's been another big focus for us since before Christmas. Does anybody have questions about that? Okay, great. Bob, you want to come up? Because he's been our point person talking not only with the DDP, but with this, the folks from the county. It's not a question about what's going on down there. Yeah. It's very clear to me what's going on. I don't know who we can contact yeah. about the trucks. Oh, um, I'm a bike rider, and those trucks are coming up from Turtle Beach about 40 miles, at 45 mile an hour. They hit the village area there where there's very little, if any, bicycle lanes, and there's tons of tourists, and they are not observing the traffic speed, the lift speed limits, and they're not even trying to stay away from people on the side, I mean, bike riders. I, I, it's been frightening. Can we call anyone? Mm -hmm. Yes, sure, we can. you can um, call. 861-5000 and ask for Curtis Smith. He's the private Curtis engineer. Smith. Curtis Smith. Smith. Curtis Smith. Smith. Remember that, all right? 861-5000. Thank you. The project is going to be the project, but they have to be respect respective of people living there and the tourists that are on. Right. I'm sure they'd like to hear from you. Yeah, absolutely. Curtis Smith. Curtis Smith is I don't amazing. know that he'd really like to hear it. <laughs> oh, I'm sure he does. He's a, he's a pretty good guy and a Thank lot of the you. feedback has been good from the folks that, that live further south yeah. even have been yeah. positive. There you go. All right. All right. Sorry to see you go. And one more question there, Bob. Yes. I, I understand that the project needed to get done because the funds were there for a while and all of a sudden we gotta use them, we gotta do it now. That's true. 
doing it during turtle season seemed a little strange since the beach is you should talk to the federal government it's yeah. their order because, and the other part is if you're if you're down there the sand is built up three to four feet not too many turtles have ladders that i know of <laughs> that just seems well, that, i have never seen a turtle with a ladder you're right yeah. So I just seen it. It's just seems strange. Right. Yeah. There. There's two things they have to do. One is put sand out there, and it's going to extend about ten feet out. The next thing they're going to do is use a grader and smooth it out so that it's not so like an escarpment. Right. Right. It'll, and then the last thing they do is they till it. They actually like plow a field, okay. like a rototiller, and that's to make it easier for the turtles to dig their nests and that's one of the requirements they have to do okay. so they're done putting sand from north from where the pile was and they're now started working going south but they haven't finished grading or tilling the north area yet so that's work yet they have to do it's true they are supposed to be done by june 30th the county asked for several months ago, FEMA to give them permission to do it later in the year away from um, all the tourists and the turtles. They wouldn't, haven't yet given permission. FEMA held to, you have to be done by June 30th and the bills turned in or they don't get six and a half million dollars. So I'm, I kind of don't think they're really gonna do that when it, comes down to it, the county's been doing yeoman effort, try to get done by June 30th. Mostly heard good reports other than this evening about the trucks and the people, the contractors down there. Right. I think if they don't, I can't believe that government won't give them the money if they miss it by just a little bit, but they're trying real hard. And um, so that's good. Yeah, All right. thank you. Yes. It's, it's great sand. It's beautiful sand. Do you know what they're doing with the turtle nest? I, yes. I've read that they have every morning before they start doing any sand work, Moat sends people out there at daybreak and they look for turtle crawls, you know, the flipper marks. If they find a nest, they relocate it someplace else okay. along the island. Yeah. There's been 24 nests so far that they've relocated. Okay. So they're taking care, and Sarasota Audubon is doing the same thing, looking for nesting seabirds, okay. shorebirds. Oh, yeah. So, and that's all the permit requirements. Um, but honestly, SKA made sure that FDEP put in there. So it's, it's not haphazard, it's not gratis. They were told they had to do it that way. Okay. Any other questions about that? Yeah, I guess I have one other piece of, oh. I'll call it bad news. Right. You know, a couple of months ago, we had a nice presentation on the roundabout that's going to be out here by the fire station. They told us about another roundabout, a mini roundabout at the corner of Ocean and Heigl. You know where that is? Kind of where Heigl comes in and then turns to the village. Starting in a week and a half on June the 12th, that intersection will be closed for one week and you'll be devoted to Mangrove Point and by the Outdoor Academy and the church. And what they're going to do is they're going to remember the picture they showed us of a mini roundabout. It will be in that intersection, it won't be any bigger, but there'll be an elevated center section with a sloped curb so you can drive over it if you're a big truck. And there'll be something that looks like a big plastic lighted bowling pin <laughs> sitting in the middle of it. And that's going to be a roundabout. Oh. <laughs> yes. Were you here two months ago? I, no, I, no, last I, I, I knew about the first round. Yeah. Well, they talked about it. It's been in the county plan for. Many years. Yeah. But I think six months ago. They never really talked about actually doing it and yeah. start the project until this. I learned out. today they're going to start In June the 12th. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, are they going to take the park then? No, there's nothing at that park. No, nothing. It's, 
Or not at the park, not at the traffic light. It's the next one down where the ocean has the trap has the stop sign. Yeah. And it'll be closed. Their plan is hopefully to get it done in three days, but they're counting on their intersection being closed for five days for a week. So just continue past if you're going south. On Heigl, just take the traffic light down Midnight Pass to Mangrove, and then I'll have you turn right on Mangrove and go back to Heigl and wind your way back to the neighborhood and the church to get back on Ocean. It's just... It's a roundabout. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I talked to the engineer today. His name is Bill Gore. He said he's not related to Al Gore. And um, he said they just couldn't figure out any way other than to shut it down. And it's experimental, which means it can be removed. So I said, well, don't bolt, bolt it down too hard. So <laughs> we'll see how it goes. But that's um, the bad news for the evening. Yeah. So the 12th, a week from next Monday, that intersection will be closed for a week. Okay. Okay. Wish I had better news. We told them no thank you, but they're going to do it anyways. <laughs> oh goodness! All right, now the church bells have rung, and luckily you had a snack, so you're not going to fade away. But it is time to adjourn the meeting, and we will not see you in July. We will see you in August. So thank you all. Have a great July, and it's good to see you all here tonight. Thank you. Bye. Now.